Welcome to the Echo Essentials Podcast. I'm Scott Clark. And I'm Dave Dale. We, uh, we have a pretty interesting uh, show today. Uh, we had an interview with Upar, our our, our our friend, intern, our intern, our intern, international uh, student. Yeah, I don't know if he is, would you classify him as an intern? Like he's been working here almost a year now, like part time, right? It's not full time because uh, because his uh, studies at Nipissing University and uh, paid so, intern staffer, right? Paid intern staffer. Yeah. Um, I was reading. Uh, I think I guess when this is airing, it would have been like last week. The uh, uh, your yeah, the newsletter last week, and you had. Uh, yeah, did you take the community survey? Did mm-hmm. you take it? I started to. Then I I, I got a little bit. Uh, um, I was reading the words of the the questions. Yes, and I didn't really like the way they were worded. And I totally agree with you. Yeah, yeah, which is unusual. And then I stopped and thought, well, why should I fill this survey out? I'm not actually a resident. And it, so it didn't distinguish. And then I thought, well, I wonder how many people that don't live in North Bay have, are taking this as well. So it seemed like there's some controls there that uh, didn't seem... How are you not... Well, I know you live just outside of town, but yeah, in Corbeil. you, were, you yeah. were thinking of running for council. Mm-hmm. Don't you have to be a resident? No, I had... Uh, uh, if you rent uh, office space oh, or business space, right. and you have a lease... Uh, you're a non-resident uh, that can vote in this uh, municipality. Gotcha. Yeah. It was interesting about this community survey about how some of those things were worded, and I'm like, oh, I don't have, there isn't like sort of a an off-ramp on how you could answer some of these questions. So it was sort of like, uh, do you, I'm trying to think of some of the language in it, but it was something about, you know, cutting city services. Yeah. Do you, do you, uh, want, do you want lower taxes? And it would be like, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, I do. And it's like, well, uh, do you want any of the services to change? Well, n- n- no. Well, like, it, and it's like, well, what do you want to cut? Well, wait a second. To me, city services like that, I think, you know, us as, you know, constituents here, it's, I look at City Hall as sort of an iceberg, right? Where, not the Titanic iceberg, but the, uh, an iceberg where you only really, what we see is the tip. There's so much that goes underneath, right, uh, of all the things at City. So asking us what we want cut is really, it's completely unfair. It's, it's you know, you're, it's your job to figure that out. Well, I think the wording of that question and, and the, uh, the multiple choice, and uh, it, it got a little awkward because it was kind of steering like, well, if you want lower taxes, you, you know, Ben, do you mind calling up the, the City of North Bay website and the survey and I think the question, I just want to read it out specifically because those words, uh, those are, it was kind of off-putting the way it was. You know, mm-hmm. you know it's hard to do those things. Um, I'm interested in to see how many people uh, actually fill out the survey um, and whether there were any controls of residents or non-residents. There might have been for a postal code or, I don't know, I, I, mm-hmm. questions to ask. Well, it's, you know, surveys are, like when in our communications company, when we do surveys, we'll, we'll often farm out to professional survey people right. because it is scientific yes. how it's done. Yeah. And if it's not done scientifically, then it's... Useless. It, it's useless. My gut told me, I, and I could be totally wrong, this didn't feel like a scientific one. Just how it was worded. Yeah, there was a couple of things I remember. Is this the survey here, the community survey? Yes. Um, go down to about uh, the tenth question. To help us better understand your priorities, please uh, specify which city services or programs you would like to see expanded or improved, or which services or programs you would consider reducing or eliminating. <sighs> hmm. And go down to number 10 as far as the choices go. Yeah. Public transit, road maintenance, snow removal. There was a, an, another question, I think it was above it. Go up to number uh, seven. Recognizing that not all community issues are within the city's control, in one sentence, what is the one issue you feel should receive the greatest attention from your mayor and members of city council? Well, I think I know what that would be, right? Would most people say the... Well, what did you say? I said homelessness and addiction. Right. Right? And, that, and that's the provincial purview. Yeah. 
But but so much of that has been downloaded to the municipality, right? Yeah. I was actually just having coffee with the mayor of Sturgeon Falls, right? So think about what where where they are uh, with it, to that respect, because DSAB, right, which they pay into Sturgeon Falls pays into. If you're given, they have a visible homeless population in Sturgeon Falls. They have to be sent to North Bay to get services. Well, <laughs> yeah, there isn't services on the ground there, so it's like, and it's it's incredibly complex. And then, like, so whose responsibility is is that when it's in the you know provincial purview? But they'll say, okay, we're going to give you some money. You guys figure it out. Like it's. You know, yeah, I, I've read a couple of things about the Sturgeon Falls uh, issues, and uh, the council's really facing a tough thing there. Yeah, yeah. So even uh, like a, a given and DSAB's other... going through their own cuts, and, and the provinces is changing things as well. So I don't know. It, it, it's so they have to they have to repair. You know the bridge when you're heading to you, it goes over the Sturgeon River. Yeah. So that has to be. I think it has like about four more years before it, they have to start doing weight restrictions on it, right? Because it has to be replaced. Whole yeah. new bridge has to go in. Yeah. And it's something like $26 million or something. Where does Sturgeon Falls, they just don't have that kind of tax base. It's a bridge, pay. yeah. And it's a bridge on the Trans-Canada Highway. Right. Yeah. But it's but that's a municipal, generally a municipal uh, um, problem. And so now the, you know, council, mayor and council has to, you know, fight to get that, you know, fixed. It's, it's so, so interesting. So when I see questions like this, like those are the things that, you know, mayor, council, th those are the big things that they're fighting with and trying to figure out how to pay for and everything they have to do. So when you're asking questions from us that say, what should be canceled? Yeah. It's like, well, like, I don't know. It's a giant iceberg, man. Yeah. Like, there's all this stuff. I have no idea how everything works. And you're asking me, like, at the tip of the iceberg, what should be canceled? Or what should be canceled? Come on. Can I ask a question? How did you guys find out about the survey? Uh, it was sent to me through uh, Chamber of Commerce. So, I had no idea the survey existed. And what I was just thinking about was, if I don't know it exists, and I'm I'm 30, right? How many younger people of my generation or younger wouldn't be able to commit to that survey because I didn't, I never heard of it. So how do you, mm. how do you hear about that? You put it on Facebook, but a lot of people my age aren't on Facebook. Right. So I think that's going to be one of, it's going to be one of those things. It's like, how do you get to the younger population when the younger population isn't using the services? Mm -hmm. How do you tell people? Because it's not like it's, it's being mailed to your door, you know, just an but, but let thought. me ask you this. So good point. And the truth of the matter is, do you own property in North Bay? No. But I do know a lot of people my age that do. Are they're just getting into it, right? Yeah. The popular where so much attention is focused on the voting population and the established population. Not where I see what you're saying, which makes total sense to me, right? You're the future. You're gonna be buying all the houses. You're gonna be buying my house. Like all that's going to turn over. But politics is sort of like what's in front of you right now what's you know what's happening here and now when we should be looking to the future and we're not yeah i'm just i'm just curious like what if I, what if i did own a house right that so is it being is it being sent to the people who own houses are they you know that's so that's kind of like the the two sides of it like even with online news sources like people my age don't use that like resources often. It's more we find like beta day is a good example of that. Not a lot of people necessarily go right to beta day. They find it through different links mm -hmm. and then that's how they get to their website or however. So it's just a the point. The point you're making actually is, uh, is interesting because uh, I was reminded about the survey, even though I had seen it when it was announced uh, by the city and I saw it in the chamber, a newsletter. Uh, I didn't think much of it. Um, I was going to follow up. And they had the results. Um, a guy that likes to stir things up contacted me and asked me, have you seen um, any promo uh, social media coverage or news coverage of this survey? Because I don't think, he told me, he says, I don't think it's been well published and well marketed. Um, so I went and I checked and the Nugget did a story uh, about the survey. Uh, there was a couple comments underneath it. It was posted to the Facebook site for the city's uh, Facebook page. 
I didn't, couldn't find it in the uh, beta day through the search, so I'm not sure if they did or not. Um, that's why I thought it was important to put in the Essentials newsletter to, to add, to, you know, one more week left to uh, fill it out. But uh, definitely they're probably, if they really wanted people to fill it out, they could have done a little bit more to it, right? Well, you're friends with the comms, the lead comms person? Yeah. Well, I, and the same guy that was contacting me about this was uh, looking at the um, communications um, consultant's report on city communications. Oh. And he was going There's through There's a report it. on it? Yeah, there was. Oh. There was an executive summary you can find uh, uh, easily enough uh, online, but uh, the full report took some digging because it wasn't in the same spot as the summary. Oh. Yeah. So the, I'd like I, to read that. Yeah. No, it's interesting. Um, were, were there any highlights you can share with us? Um, well, basically, uh, uh, it said, uh, do more, better. <laughs> I, from the executive summary, I, I could have done that on um, a napkin at lunch, um, but I'm sure they went into more detail. I did find the, the, the full report. I haven't looked through it all, mm -hmm. um, but uh, it, this is a good topic. Right? Yeah. Good point. Well, you say with the changing landscape of media, it used to be like it had to be in the nugget. Yeah. It had, had official things were in the nugget. Uh, tertiary things would often get uh, into radio and they would promote mm -hmm. different things through radio and then you would supplement all that with some sort of television coverage as well, right? Mm -hmm. And so you really had all your bases covered. It's so different now and, you know, Ben's talking about it, right? Yeah. If you're not a regular going to the, the city's um, uh, website and you're not on their Facebook page every day, um, I follow it but I don't get any notices of it because mm -hmm. it's restricted to what you get. Um and there's still a, there's a gap, I think, for sure. For sure. And I don't think it's been, you know, figured out just yet. I want to take a moment to congratulate the uh, organizers and everybody who attended the uh, Bay Block Party. I think, uh, I think I'm so happy that they do it. They've had good weather again this year. Uh, and I'm just really happy that someone's doing stuff like that. And I hope uh, people continue to support them. And I hope politically we continue to support the Bay Block Party and and uh, and if it ever does grow or not, right? Well, interestingly, uh, um, I ended up uh, talking to a person uh, that's involved with community safety and well-being, and uh, we were talking about whether or not the the homeless and the uh, homeless uh, people or addiction uh, addic addicts uh, would be uh, sort of in conflict with the uh, uh, the downtowns. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I also, uh, when I went there to watch a couple bands, the first thing somebody told me was, oh, you just missed it. They had to drag a guy out by the, uh, in a headlock um, because he was uh, going through a, um, uh, the drugs were taking effect and he was disturbing people. Mm. Uh, so uh, then I talked to one of the uh, bouncers and uh, they had to take out three guys, I think, that uh, just didn't mix with the public down there. Mm. Um, uh, I thought it was an excellent thing for the two acts I did see. I wasn't there in the late evening when it was really crowded, um, but it looks like from the photos, it was uh, another great success. Mm -hmm. And I Good didn't hear them. of anything other than those little incidents. Mm -hmm. But uh, I do know that I was uh, not interested in parking my car down there because I had heard the, there was cars being broken into along the waterfront a couple weekends ago. It's just smashing grabs, right? Wow. So, um, and... I don't know. Uh, it was part of my decision. Uh, it was late at night and I didn't want to go down there too. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just really happy that, you know, we do this and, and, uh, it continues to grow. And I just want to, because I know people who do organize these things spend an entire year of their time and then that entire weekend putting it all together and, and executing it. So congratulations to all them. We have Upar coming up. Uh, but I, I wanted to give a shout out to Stu Campaign from uh, Bay Today. He had an interesting uh, story recently about, you know, the kind of money foreign students are bringing to uh, a Canada or college. It's a significant amount of money. Oh, yeah. It was an August 9th piece that he put together that caught my eye. Um, and he, uh, the headline was Canada, Canada to repeat record $167 million in international student fees. And uh, that's, that's an insane amount. It's an insane amount of money. So I, had, I was reading through it and trying to figure out how that works because they were talking about the, 
Last year, they had 2,677 domestic students and 2,700 international students enrolled. There was an expectation with the changes in the uh, international student rules that there was going to be a lot less this year. Um, but uh, they expect uh, around 2,650 domestic and a, a drop down to 2,430 international students, but they won't know for another until midway into September for real, the numbers. But the most interesting thing I saw there, and this answered part of my question, because there's no way 2,700 international students are bringing yeah. 167 million into Where's Canada. Where's all the money coming from? So what, here's, a, here's a paragraph that kind of says... Thousands more study through Centers for International Learners at the Canador-affiliated Stanford International College of Business and Technology campuses located in Brampton, Mississauga, and Scarborough. Hmm. Right. So I didn't know they were in Scarborough. That's they, where I grew up. They, they count towards uh, Canador's overall and that number. But that clues in on, I think I looked at the 2022 numbers or 2020 numbers at one point where there was $120 million in fees, but it cost them $80 million, right? And, I'm, and th those numbers didn't jive for local. But So that answers this. Of the $167 million that Canada records as, as uh, revenue, uh, there's expenses that aren't paid here. They're paid down there at those other campuses, ah. right? So there's a lot of people making money off this. Really? And it's not really evident as... If it's not clear. Yeah, I'd like to, we won't go into it now, but I'd like to learn a little bit more about that, about what these affiliate schools are. Like I remember Nipissing had an affiliate uh, in, uh, campus in Brantford. Well, even Canada had one in, I think, Perry Sound. Yes, they still do. And they still do. So like that's how I sort of envision, but I think those are like actual campuses. Yeah, like, yeah. You know, they're smaller, but they're actual not campuses. Not affiliated campuses. Yeah, I don't know what that is. That sounds like they'd be in a strip mall. Is that one of those? I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. No. It'd be interesting to find out more. But Upar has been with us for a year now. He's a great kid, super smart. And I'm glad you brought him back in so we could have a chat with him about his experience the last year here in North Bay and uh, and in Canada. Well, he was the one that uh, taught me how not to eat raw vegetables. I, oh, I was taking, I, was, I grew beans this year. Yeah. So I was. I brought in some and I said, these are great. I can eat them just right, right off the stem. And he goes, yeah. yeah, no, I'm cooking those things. I said, no, go ahead. You can eat them. They're good. I, I eat them all the time. But I only eat one or two at a time. Yeah. Apparently, uh, after he said that, I, I went and looked. And uh, uh, you definitely want to cook those things because there's, a, there's a, a lectin of some sort that if you eat four, five, six, some people will get very nauseous and vomit, right? Because your, uh, your, your guts can't really deal with it and they can't digest it right. Huh. But I've been eating raw vegetables out of the garden, but I only eat a, a small amount. Yeah. So I haven't felt that before. So but there you go. He taught me something. There. He's taught me lots, actually. Let's get to part. North Bay Echo is proud to partner with Twigs Coffee Roasters, a part of the community since 1995. Twigs offers a wide selection of quality beans, fresh roasted in-house every day. Find your favorite specialty drinks at our espresso bar. Rejuvenate with freshly squeezed juice or treat yourself to mouth-watering selections from our gourmet deli. And don't forget our irresistible fresh baked goods, including uncompromising gluten-free options. Twigs has five locations to serve you from North Bay to Sturgeon Falls to Sudbury. Order line for pickup at twigs.ca. And coming soon, you'll be able to order fresh roasted coffee beans direct to your doorstep from our distribution center in North Bay. Today, we're celebrating the first year in Canada for Upar. Wow. Right on. Happy anniversary, Upar. Thank you so much, Scott. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be here. It's been a, it's been a great year for me. Yeah. For those who uh, don't remember, uh, Upar was one of um, the people we interviewed uh, during our kickoff, uh, actually about three months into our kickoff for the Echo uh, Studios, and uh, you're an international student studying at Nipissing University, working yes. here at Clark Communications. 
Yes, um, I landed here. Actually, tomorrow is going to be my anniversary in North Bay. Actually, mm. uh, I landed in North Bay in twenty uh, on twenty ninth of August. So I landed here. A um, couple of months. It took me a couple of months to you know adjust to the environment here and. Yeah, uh, lo- was looking out for jobs. I remember I was reaching out and I came here, met Scott, and yeah, got a job here, and it's been it's been great. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's been incredible. Well, you didn't meet me right away. Right? Yeah, you were persistent. It was awesome. <laughs> you kept yeah. coming back, kept yeah. coming back. Can I meet him again? Can I meet him? And finally, uh, finally, we linked up, and yeah. yeah, and that's how I just I loved your persistency that you kept coming. Nobody nobody ever knocks on the door and delivers resumes and stuff anymore. Yeah, um, so what happened was, uh, so this is how I basically landed here. What happened was I was giving out resumes all over North Bay. I was going to North Gate, going to different restaurants, and I was like, okay, what should I, and I wasn't getting any luck, you know, there was I wasn't getting any jobs, and I was like, okay, I do have a skill set, I am educated enough, and I have a professional work experience, how about I try a different path where not a lot of, because a lot of international students at that time, were actually dropping resumes the same way I was uh, mm. all across North Bay, but most of them were dropping again at, in the restaurants, in the in the mall, in the different stores. And I was like, okay, I should go with a different approach. Maybe I should use the skills that I already have of professional work experience and go to d- go to different you know business organizations here. So that's what I did. Then I actually I went to different uh, and. I wanted to be in marketing uh, because marketing was my, you know, my forte here in Nipissing as well. So I was, so I went to different marketing firms here. I went and yeah, I came to Clark here as well. I went to Asante Wealth Management there as well. Mm-hmm. And interesting thing, uh, the lady who was at the front desk at Asante Wealth Management, she looked at my resume and she, oh, you're doing marketing in Nipissing. And I was like, yeah, uh, I'm doing marketing in Nipissing. And why don't you go to Clark Communications? <laughs> and interestingly, uh, I told her, I did went there. Oh, yeah, you should meet Scott. He's a great guy. <laughs> I would do that. So, yeah, that's when I realized as well that it, it is a small town and everyone knows everyone. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a, yeah uh, but that's how I landed here. And thankfully, I was persistent. And my first interaction here was with Dave, actually, uh, when I came here. So when I met Dave, he took my resume. He was, to be honest, he was really, really kind and amazing. Very good. Yes. Really? Yeah, he was. <laughs> so, yeah, that's shocking. Yeah. And then the second time, actually, I met Michaela and dropped the resume. And Michaela, you know, as always, is incredible. So, yeah, that's how I basically did. And that's how I landed here. I'd like to know about persistency. Yeah. So, first time you dropped off your resume. Yeah. You didn't get a response? Uh, I didn't. Okay. So, I'm... why did you come back? It's because... I so I needed job. I needed a job to sustain myself because yeah. I do have. We do get a fund. Let's say when when international students come here, we do deposit a fund of ten thousand dollars, right, from yeah. back home. But I knew that wouldn't be enough for me to sustain myself here, right? And that's where my, I was like, okay, I need to get this done. And actually, where I worked before as well, uh, I, I was working night shifts back home in India. And it was a Canadian company for which I was working for. And there, actually, I learned a lot about persistency because I ha- my job was to talk to truck drivers and get the important documents from them. Mm-hmm. And truck drivers, with the because of the kind of profession they are in, it's a very rough profession because they have to drive like thousands of kilometers, hundreds of kilometers every day, thousands of kilometers every week. So they're quite rough. So you had to be kind of persistent with them and mm-hmm. be, you know, be polite, be respectful and be persistent with them to get those documents. So, and plus the environment of night shifts as well. And I was working in uh, some, sometimes even like 12 hour shifts in the beginning. Well, afterwards I got a promotion and uh, my my basically workload reduced. But because of that work experience, it built a lot of persistence in me. And it has to, uh, it has to be... It has to be from my upbringing as well because I grew up in a military school. Uh-huh. So I went to the military school and military schools, uh, I, I was sharing this story with Mikhail as well. They are quite heavy on discipline, right? Like my hair right now are too long. I won't have that in my school. Um, it's called Army Public School. I won't have that in, I can't have that in that school. Mm-hmm. I, have my, I have to have my hair very short and everything has to be quite disciplined. I was shaving 
ever since I was in grade seven. Oh no, sorry, grade nine, because I started getting some beard and and the school was like, oh, you cannot keep that. You have to shave it. And I was shaving because of that since grade nine. So all these little things kind of added up. And that's where I think my persistence uh, kind of built. And it's not just me. Um, I believe a lot of international students who have come here recently, not just recently, who have come here before, they all had that persistence because they knew they're away from home, right? They, they have to, they cannot rely on Indian rupee money to survive here, right? Because the dollar is basically in exchange rates is expensive. So you cannot sustain yourself like that. So that's a lot of international students are persistent as well, uh, persistent as well. And that is something which is an innate quality, uh, not just in me, but in all of international students, yes. Well, that's a, a good sort of um, segue into one of the real news topics going on right now. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about, because there's a protest by students across uh, the country for the new rules of uh, how Canada is going to apply and uh, be deporting. So yeah. A lot of students that were hoping that they could get their residency here. What, what are you hearing about that? So uh, I think it's in Prince Edward Island. Uh, it is all uh, a lot of protests have been happening all across Canada, but mainly uh, the biggest protest I think happened in Prince Edward Island. And basically, what happens is is when you complete your two year course or one year course, let's say you complete your two year course, you get a three year work permit after being a student, and you work here. And based on that, then you get uh, your scores. Based on your scores, then you get your permanent residency. Now, what is, what has happened is uh, these provinces like Prince Edward Island or Alberta, right? These provinces, it was easier to get permanent residency before. So a lot of students, they used to get their, let's say, they completed their studies in Ontario maybe. They'll move to these islands uh, because they can fulfill their, let's say, permanent residency requirements there, right? And... So oh, what happened was when they, a lot of students, when they came there, they shifted there and the rules, they changed it overnight. And the reason why they're protesting is, is like, okay, we have come here now and yeah, we have come here now and they basically feel and they are being, you know, it is being unjust on them by changing the rules overnight of immigration because they planned their whole lives out the way um, because of that. So it is, uh, and I want to say this openly because people don't have this, these open conversations is that immigrate, especially international student program in general is a leave for immigration in Canada. People, uh, although uh, it is, uh, although I know we, we are told that, okay, you have to complete your two degrees and then you go back home. Uh, if you have applied for work permit, you can work for three years more. But it has been used by the agents, uh, the immigration agents or consultants and uh, even the educational institutes, uh, you know, to get that interna international students money because we pay three times the tuition, a higher tuition fee than the other student than the local students. And it, uh, it acted as a levy for immigration as well. Right. And. And that is the reason why uh, the international student numbers increased in Canada as well. It was because it was a pathway to immigration to Canada, mm. right? So let's say, I'll tell you, uh, I was just looking at the numbers before coming here. Ever since 2013, uh, the number of international students in 2013 was around 300,000 uh, students, right? It has jumped up to a million students in Canada right now, right? And majority of the uh, international immigration population have actually come from countries like India and China, right? India has been the biggest from where I'm from and China has been at the second. Right now, presently, there are million students and a uh, majority of them are from India. And what it has led to is that uh, it has led to, on, and, and I'm seeing this online i'm not seeing this in my day-to-day -day lives because i talk to canadians i i live i live with canadians i talk to canadians every day i've never faced it but I, it has led to a lot of online hatred and some some of uh, ignorant comments and yeah it's it's sad to see uh, because the international students who have come here they have not come here illegally they fulfilled the requirements which were set by the government mm -hmm. at the uh, at the you know federal level that okay you need to have these requirements and they were given a proper visa and they were given you know and uh, you know this Scott um, I can work twenty hours when I'm 
uh, when I'm in the university, right? So they were they are given you know the the right to work for 20 hours as well. So they are not trying to steal Canadians jobs. They're just trying to you know uh, survive by the rules which are set by the government. And but unfortunately, it has led to a lot of online. And I see this online. I haven't uh, experienced it offline, but I do see this online. A lot of you know negative comments and hatred. Yep. And this is and yeah regarding the protests. Yeah, it's uh, it's all across Canada. Majorly, it happened in Prince Edward Island. And the reason why international students are feeling the frustration is because uh, they changed the rules. Uh, you know just straight away and they are how exactly did they change the rules um, they would come here as a student and then they would get their work permit yeah and w- what exactly did they change so uh, what happened was uh, in prince edward island because it's a small community as well prince edward island right it's uh, it's i understand the the government's uh, perspective on this as well so what happened was they uh, something along the immigration rules and guidelines uh, so you need a certain score and uh, there are so i think you get pnps now i'm not a uh, i will admit i'm not a perfect uh, i'm not a i'm not a perfect guy to give you more clarity on that because uh, someone like someone who's an immigration consultant might be able to tell you more about those rules being changed and the students who are protesting there but let's say but i can give you an example of local here so arnip is a is a immigration pathway here right uh, so arnip recently they they said uh, you know what we are not going to give uh, you know permanent residency to fast food uh, workers or immigrants who are working uh, fast food workers right it's kind of that sort of change which kind of led to you know uh, them protesting uh, okay so, so some of the work that they're doing no longer exactly. counts towards what they thought it would exactly so uh, and because they were not prepared and their work permit actually uh, a lot of the students in PEI they were applying for their work permit extensions as well and uh, they didn't and the government basically said we are not going to extend your work permit because they already have jobs they just wanted extension and uh, and the students said okay we understand you know uh, we we would have understood that you didn't extend the work permits uh, if it wasn't uh, if you have never done that but previously the government did extend the work permit more permits right when they required especially in covid uh, 19 era so it must have something to do with um, the lack of accommodation across the country exactly and the yeah. economics that are taking place right exactly uh, it has and and this is where um it is it is incredible to see that the international student population having been increased a lot we there is a direct correlation of that being you know uh, related to housing housing situations as well you know especially in major cities north bay is still uh, in a very better place but i would tell you like in major cities like in brampton brampton is one of the you know biggest hubs uh, of immigration right there are students being exploited uh, at work at you know they're living in uh, in houses as well where like one a landlord have given uh, students the house like 20 students living in one house that is not the way you can live here right who's ex- so, who's exploiting though is it the students exploiting the house or the no, landlord the charging landlords. all t- all 20 people the landlord charging all 20 people and they agreed to it right but yeah. they cannot complain about that and this is a very interesting scenario where and I, and I, and I feel sad to say this is because a lot of international students when they come here they are not prepared for it right they are not prepared for that they are going to see all these struggles right and what happens is a lot of the times when they come here they work under let's say an indian employer or someone from their own community right now a lot of international students might not have a, don't have the same level of english language proficiency as i have mm-hmm. right a big advantage for me was i was able to speak in the uh, in the english language fairly well and able to convert you know have conversations with different people so i was able to open my avenues and apply for different jobs and so somehow i landed and i love it here right but a lot of international students they they're not that pro- proficient in english language so they end up working for, sorry they end up working for uh, and you know someone from their own community someone who's a business owner and what happens is and this is something which people don't know international students who have come here their parents have basically spent their entire life savings to send them to canada and study here right 
with so, the hope that they can become residents, the, like with the hope in, they can citizenship. become uh, residents or citizens of Canada and beca- have a better future, right? So there's a lot of pressure on international students here, hmm. right? So when they land here, and there's a second year tuition as well, which international students have to pay, and a lot of international students sometimes feel uh, fell short of funds because of that. Right, so they have to work, uh, and twenty-hour limit might not give them the, you know, the opportunity to pay that tuition fees. So what happens is they end up working for, you know, some of the business owners who are f- from their own community, and they work for cash, let's say, on mm. off the books or under the table. But what happens is a lot of the times, and this is a really sad part, that the international student then gets exploited because the the business owner, what he does is. He actually doesn't pay them for like three or four months or maybe never Mm. because he knows he cannot go out and complain. The international student cannot go out and complain that, okay, he hasn't paid my wages, right? So when that happens, it's a really sad situation for an international student then. And and it's not just working, right? They have to manage their studies as well, side by side. Are you saying that, uh, I'll say the racism... Yeah, uh, the the racism that you've seen or heard about, yeah, is sometimes more so with people from South Asia, yeah, to South Asian so people that are coming here, as opposed to traditional, you um, know, white so Canadians. It's a really interesting. Uh, uh, it's a really interesting point. So. The online racism I'm seeing, so uh, because the the name of the accounts are very vague, right? So I cannot uh, deduct who's white and who's, uh, you know, from any ethnicity, right? Right. But what I've seen here when I come here, a lot of the times, international students who come here are exploited by their own. Yeah. Right. Which is a really sad situation to be in. Really. And uh, what happens is, and I'm, uh, and I really want people, especially the viewers, to think about it from an international student perspective. Suppose you go, you are 17 or 18 year old, you go to an entirely new country, you don't know the rules and regulations of culture that well. You speak the language, but not in that proficiency, right? And you have, and then you go to someone from your own community, and you getting uh, end up getting exploited by them, right? And then. Because, and a lot of international students, especially the young ones who are like 17, 18 years old, who have just come after high school, they live in a bubble. They, they, they are not able to integrate with, uh, because they don't know the language really well, they are not a- able to integrate with local Canadians. Mm. And this is what I tell all the international students uh, who, I, who have come recently, and even uh, came rec- as recently as January, I was telling them, listen, don't just rely. I'm not saying... and. I'm not saying our entire community is bad. No, there are a lot of great Indian, uh, Indian you know, Indian, um, Indian community members who have done great for this country and are really supporting international students. But there are a few of them who do such things and then they exploit them, right? But it's really interesting point. You're saying yes, a lot of the times it is the uh, the member from the same community who's actually exploiting them. Founded in 1968, Voyager Aviation is a proud member of our community, providing worldwide aviation services from our headquarters right here in North Bay. If you're looking for a challenge, change, or want to expand your current career in aviation, Voyager is hiring for a wide range of technical and non-technical roles, including pilots, aircraft maintenance personnel, corporate administration, machinists, supply chain professionals, and more. Be part of a workforce that is over 400 strong, supporting humanitarian, government, defense, and civil aviation operations around the world. For a career in aviation and beyond, learn more about open positions and career paths at voyav.com. So now that you've been here a year, uh, you probably, when you were coming here a year ago, or over a year ago, you probably had like this is what I think it's going to be like. Yeah. Now you've been here a year. W- what is it that? Oh, I knew it was going to be like this. That's exactly how it was. Or is like that's nothing how I thought it was going to be. I'll be honest. I was quite well versed about the situation here before uh, I came here because a lot of my friends from back home they immigrated here. 
all the two different mm-hmm. cities, Can- like to, okay. to Canada, yeah. to to uh, Toronto and or Vancouver. So the and f- uh, the, the good thing about having friends here already was that they were able to give me a very unfiltered perspective about the situation here, mm-hmm. right? And they actually wanted me to come here because they knew how good I was in terms of speaking English, and he, they knew I would be able to integrate it really well, mm-hmm. and. and they were basically telling me on uh, on filter okay you know the the basically desi uh, indians are called desi right don't work for a desi employer <laughs> which is like and uh, because and they were like okay just work under canadians and different and try to open up your horizons as much as possible so and my sister being at uh, being in america and she's married to a canadian citizen actually so my sister being in america and she spent a bit of time here as well she she all, already gave me a very open view on the west in general so i was quite prepared so i didn't had i didn't had any assumptions before i came in uh the thing i was actually the thing i was shocked by was the work culture and I, and this is where um, because I work in Clark right and basically Scott is my boss and I'm not trying to butter you up here but <laughs> so so what happened was I remember so what happened was uh, before where I was working right it was 300 400 uh, people working in one office right it was a big office big floor right as you see in in big companies right so what how ha- used to happen was I never expected right uh, that of someone from let's say someone who's a CEO or a president would come up to an intern right and basically ask him oh how are you doing are you good right so i never saw that work culture uh, there was always these hierarchies you have to follow them and you know the way the corporate works right so when i came here and scott come uh, comes in and uh, is joking with me and he's the ceo and i'm like wow this is this is something which i have never experienced right so that is something uh, which which i to be honest i really laughed about uh, and it was a person shock hmm. and uh, the other shock was uh, how especially the locals here how open and respectful they are about your life choices in a way so um a lot of my friends canadians even at the workplace and uh, i go to uh, the gym for mixed martial arts there when action I, mma action mma yeah shout out to those guys amazing people mm. so what happens is so when i tell them about some of my beliefs and my you know let's say so although they they sometimes jokes about my vegetarianism but, mm-hmm. <laughs> but but apart from jokes they're quite respectful of uh, what like let's say i don't eat meat right mm-hmm. so they're quite respectful about it they don't uh, say anything derogatory to, to me or put me down right it, it's all in fun and it, it's all jokes right mm-hmm. which which was a really really great surprise yeah mm. nobody could have prepared you for north bay though like <laughs> <laughs> like your your friends that lived in Toronto and Vancouver exactly. you're like nobody was here and North Bay is a lot different tell tell me about the differences or the things that you notice about North Bay that are different than what you thought would that mean. it is a very although it it has a population of 50,000 but it is a very close knit tight community mm. and um, that is what i wasn't prepared for because here it feels like everyone knows everyone right the, the funny instance is uh, where i used to live before the apartment of chief chief skates i told barry who's the owner of chief skates that uh, i got a job at clark communications and he was like oh yeah scott is a great guy <laughs> <laughs> right and everybody knows everybody exactly everybody knows everybody here and uh, the funny thing is uh, initially when i came here we were Uh, you must have seen the news the, the students were struggling to find housing here right mm-hmm. and everyone was going around so i was uh, so we had actually inquired about different houses to a bunch of different people right and we got one with the, the same apartment above cheapskates and uh, the funny thing was we were actually when there was some you know builders who were building housing housing and i went up to one guy and say you know what can you uh, can you please you know uh, if you're a builder if you know someone who's renting a place please let us know and he actually was really gracious he gave me his number and i gave him my number and then he calls me and say oh you you know what this is there is a one house on on rent and it turns out it's the same house sorry it's the same apartment which is above cheap skates oh jee <laughs> so, she- yeah so it's it's like that uh, so a little instances like this you realize okay this is a, this is a small town and uh, what oh, do you oh where are you living now and how much and how many people so i live in i live at douglas street mm-hmm. and uh, it's uh, we have four people there uh, in the in the house and right now to be honest i have my own room so i, I love it <laughs> <laughs> right so i have the privacy and, uh, yeah it's been 
uh, it's been great uh, ever since I, how much you all pay uh, it's around 2100 mm-hmm. uh, for for f- i think it's th- yeah three bedroom and two bathrooms right and uh, 2100 for three bedrooms and two bathrooms and uh, yeah uh, per person and mine is the utilities uh, i have to pay for you it. it's interesting i just got the utility bill, <laughs> utility bill so 2100 right for yeah. three bedrooms plus utilities exactly and yeah. heat uh, like that's utilities. Uh, anything else in, included? Uh, what no, about, nothing uh, is. Uh, utilities are not included. Okay. I have to pay the utilities. We have to pay the utilities extra. So it, it round and internet and that kind of thing. Exactly. So that's it, on top. Yeah. So it rounds off to about like five. Uh, sorry, twenty three hundred uh, in total, uh, and it it gets divided among four people. So yeah, amazing. So what do you think it's going to be like for this uh, second year that you're here, now that you have one year under your belt? It's really interesting. I, I don't have, uh, to be honest. Um, what are your courses uh, for the second year in Nipissing's uh, so marketing program? Courses uh, this year is mainly is going to be around specialization in marketing. So a lot of my courses are going to be related to consumer behavior. Thank God I'm, I've been getting rid of, I, I won't be studying maths and statistics, although I understand those are important, I, I hate it. But yeah, more it's going to be more specialized subjects, specialized subjects related to marketing, whether it's consumer behavior and, you know, maybe product management and stuff. So yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to my second year. And uh, yeah, it's going, all I know the next eight months are going to be really busy because I remember when I started working here in November, November to April went like that. Because I was studying, uh, I, I think you must have noticed, right? I was, uh, I, I would have a class at two o'clock, so I will work here till two o'clock and then go to class, right? So that that's going to be the You're same for the next have eight a busy year. year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the next eight months, especially. Yeah. We had a talk when you uh, you came to me, and you're, you're you're kind of thinking about all the racist stuff you were seeing online. Yeah, and it was conflicting with the fact that you, here yep. you haven't. Uh, experience that exactly and, yeah. and my advice was get offline <laughs> yeah <laughs> exactly yeah. yeah that is such uh, I that is such a Dave reply <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> right get offline yeah but yeah uh, so actually uh, and there were instances which happened so uh, on Wasaga Beach uh, there was a news of you know uh, th- there was this girl who posted a TikTok video of saying oh no you know there's this Indian family who pooped on the beach and the Indians are pooping on the beach yeah th- it was a huge controversy <laughs> you should have been online and I was like uh, I don't know if they are. And then it went to that level where the mayor actually had to come out and say, you know what, uh, we actually take care of sanitation, you know, really, really seriously. And you know what, uh, this incident, there have been no, you know, there have been no evidence of that happening. But then another thing happened where there was this uh, image of an elderly sick man in Brampton pooping at a gas station and then this whole rhetoric started again. That, oh, you know what? This is <laughs> pooping happening. Indians are pooping everywhere. And I was like, holy shit. I mean, and <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So when that happened, and then the See, owner... See, that's the, the shit online you got to exactly. stay away from. <laughs> and, then the, and then the owner of the gas station tweets about it and says, no, this, this didn't happen. Uh, this is Photoshop, blah, blah, blah. And still, I mean, and this is happening online a lot. And... and it kind of hurts me sometimes because, and because even if let's say an, an elderly sick man or any elder for that matter uh, did that, um, and this is where f- from this is how I think because where I was born, any elder if if someone of that age does that, I wouldn't I won't post it online, mm. right? I won't I won't try to belittle them because uh, they're elderly, right? They we, you don't know the you know, the issues they might be facing in that situation or the health problems they might be situation, uh, facing at that situation, right? So it was really interesting to see the, the internet's <laughs> reply I'll, to that. I'll, I'll give you a little uh, uh, yeah. something you can reply with. I happen to have had to um, uh, defecate in public twice in my life. And it was uh, nothing I could avoid. Uh, there, <laughs> And uh, so you can say that you know a white guy that's done that. <laughs> oh yeah, it's, it, 
actually it started happening so a lot of then <laughs> indians started uh, you know recording the weird shit you know the canadians were doing <laughs> well that's <laughs> the thing <laughs> and started posting it online and i was like this is not the way you had all this thing i mean yeah. so this is what i believe in you i don't like putting you know fingers at each other mm-hmm. like oh you did this or do that if mm-hmm. something wrong happens it's way better to bring people together and say you know what this is wrong this is how we're going to handle it right but i don't think that you know put putting fingers at each other and trying to find faults at each other work well uh, in life in general I, and this is my opinion well yeah. upar it's been uh, this last year just a real joy getting to know you yeah getting to work with you your work ethic how smart you are you fit in really well with the team uh you've added a lot to like our culture you've helped me understand things i i come <laughs> in after watching a documentary about india or something and i'll yeah. ask upar like eight questions about it and then he, he yeah. informs me of uh all the things about history and so we just really appreciate you know you being part of our team and and coming in here and and talking with us oh It's amazing. Thank you Scott. Yeah, I appreciate you. it too. And uh I'll be honest, like this past one year have been amazing, uh especially like working here and getting to know everyone. Mm-hmm. It's been it's been an incredible experience and looking forward to second year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks. Well, that was another uh uh very enjoyable uh conversation with mm-hmm. Upar. I think uh to see his passion and his uh, eloquence and trying to explain himself it was really cool. Mm-hmm. I didn't think the I would say the the people that are taking advantage of these South Asian students are generally from South Asia. That sort of <laughs> that took me back about who's who's taking advantage of some of these kids. Well, definitely that's uh, that's taken place. I've heard of that before and obviously he's uh, probably got some closer secondhand uh, mm-hmm. information. Uh it's a shame that anybody would be taking care uh, advantage of people like that. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just not right. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it was a great interview. But welcome to Canada. Somebody might take advantage of you. <laughs> yeah, just wait till they start paying taxes. Then they'll really take advantage of you. Well, thanks for joining. Please uh, you know, sign up for the newsletter. Uh it comes out Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's free and it goes straight to your uh, email. All right. Just go to uh, northbayecho.ca. For further information, I'm Scott Clark and I'm Dave Dale. We'll talk to you next time. Hi, I'm Ben, podcast producer here at North Bay Echo, and the Echo Essentials newsletter is a great way to get all of the news and events that are happening in the North Bay area. and of course all the newest podcast episodes in one neat package and it's very easy to sign up and you can get subscribed in a few simple steps so first you're going to want to head on over to northbayecho.ca while you're on the home page you'll see some of the shows that we offer but we want to keep scrolling down to this panel right here and you can see there is a box to type in an email address for the echo essentials newsletter so all you have to do is type in your email make sure to check the box below And what this will allow us to do is to send you the newsletter to your email and of course your info as always is protected by your privacy policy. Hit sign me up and you are good to go. You are officially a subscriber of the Echo Essentials newsletter. If you do want to check out our past newsletters as well, you can hit the past newsletter option to go right there or you can just hit the newsletter tab at the top of the page. And now you can see all of the past newsletters that have been published. And there you have it. Super easy and simple. And now every Tuesday and Thursday you will get Echo Essentials right to your inbox.